A very warm welcome to the second seminar in our Westminster Abbey Advent series, A Great and Mighty Wonder. These contemplative Advent seminars are in part enabled through the generosity of the National Gallery in sharing four images for us to consider over these Monday lunchtimes. Last week, Professor Beth Williamson from Bristol University and our own Dean, Dr. David Hoyle, reflected on Fra Filippo Lippi's Annunciation. If you missed that seminar, you can watch it on the Abbey's YouTube channel. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Al Akers, the head of the Art History Department at Georgetown University, Washington, DC, as together we will discuss Hirtgen Tutz and Jan's painting, Nativity at Night. It's a huge thrill to have Professor Akers with us. Al, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of today's seminar. In our time, it can be far too easy to forget just how different the aims and means of art were in the past. The 15th century painting before us today, A Nativity at Night, was made long before museums. The artists, Kerkin Totsenkians, would have been baffled by what we're doing today, and I don't mean just by the internet that brings us together. The fact that his work is available to so many and has been seen over the years by millions of visitors to the National Gallery would have been unfathomable. Even the category of art as we know it didn't exist. He painted the picture as an instrument of prayer for someone. And yet, like so many pre-modern works, it continues to absorb attention centuries after that very specific target audience. In our time, many will dwell chiefly on the uh, religious message, while others are drawn to dimensions that seem more artistic. We should begin today by recognizing that they were inseparable, the religious and the artistic, when the painting was made. The Nativity, a tableau centered on the newborn Christ, had long been one of the most familiar subjects in Christian art. But the familiarity of a subject uh, did not mean that individual representations looked alike. Their differences were often a matter of the medium, painting, sculpture, tapestry, what have you, uh, uh, of the individual style of the artist uh, in many cases. But just as often, and this is the case especially in the 15th century, familiar subjects were constantly reconceived to shape specific ideas for specific circumstances where a 21st century visitor to an art museum will often casually regard a work as another Madonna or another crucifixion. During the Renaissance, the differences between each new formulation of a subject could mean everything. We saw a very rich example last week in the first of these seminars for Advent. The Annunciation, painted by Fra Filippo Lippi for the Medici family in Florence, was extraordinary in part because the splendor of the setting and materials around Mary and Gabriel would have looked at home in the majesty of the Medici palace. For the very deep theology of Lippi's picture, about which we heard last week, uh, was deeply colored by its status as a gleaming possession in a spectacular collection. The circumstances were very different for today's painting. The Nativity at Night was painted a few decades later, probably around 1490, and much farther north in the Dutch city of Haarlem. For this one, we have no early records, no contracts, no documentation of ownership, no remarks by early observers, not even a signature or date on the picture. We do, however, have a few brief texts uh, from more than a century after the painting was made that have allowed art historians to identify the artist and the likely patrons of the work. Herk in Totsentians is a nickname. His given name was Herit, uh, Gerard in English. Uh, Herkin is a diminutive, something like, uh, something like Jerry or Little Jerry. Uh, Totsentians is not a name, but a descriptor. It means at St. John's and refers to the commandery of the Knights of St. John. The Knights were a military religious order founded centuries before in Jerusalem and a very prominent institution in Harlem, this branch of the Knights were. And Harlem at this point, a bustling, very prosperous port city. 
Perkin lived among the knights, probably as a lay brother of the community, with a specific job as something like in-house artist. We know that his largest work was an altarpiece uh, for the high altar of the knights, uh, and we know, or we are told, that he died young, probably at the age of 28. The nativity at night is small, uh, about 34 centimeters, uh, 13 inches, little more than 13 inches tall, painted on oak panel, as was typical for Netherlandish paintings in this period. A religious picture this size uh, would have been made not for an altar or a public space, but for an individual, very likely one of the knights of St. John. Several of Kierkegaard Tot St. John's other surviving works are also small pictures, surely made for the prayers and reflections of individual owners. Uh, some paintings made at this scale would have been hung on walls. Uh, sometimes they would have been propped on surfaces, perhaps on a tabletop, uh, and probably quite often they would have been held in one's own hands for contemplation to be able to come quite close to the image. Now, it has long been recognized that Kierkegaard's image was adapted in part from a night nativity by Hugo van der Kroos, uh, a very important, very prolific master based in Ghent to the south in what is now, of course, Belgium. The original of that painting is lost, but copies of it make the relationship unmistakable. Uh, the most significant difference in these uh, variants being that the, uh, the Virgin and Child appear on the left side. Uh, or I should say the Virgin and Joseph appear on the left rather than the right, as they do in the Schaefkin painting. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, the, um, we also know that the uh, Herkin Tote St. John's panel has been trimmed a little bit on each of the four sides. Uh, that might have been done in the early 20th century when the panel was damaged in the fire. Mary kneels in prayer over the manger with Joseph in shadow behind her. And because Joseph can retire a little too far into these shadows, I bring you a bit closer here uh, to be sure you see him. Five angels gather in wonder and devotion, while a sixth glowing in the distance brings the news of the miracle to the shepherds. The ox and the ass are very near in half light between Mary and the angels. Uh, although the animals are not mentioned in the gospel accounts of the nativity, that is the gospels of uh, Luke and Matthew, uh, they had regularly been pictured at the scene for more than a millennium. Uh, the the uh, animals appearing as early as the fourth century in some of our earliest images of the nativity. They were interpreted in different ways in different periods, but always recognizing a prophetic seed in the first book of Isaiah. And I quote, the ox knoweth his master, the ass his master's manger, or sometimes translated as his master's crib. That's a distinction that was often understood uh, as referring to the people of Israel and the Gentiles. It is, however, rarely very clear whether a Renaissance artist intended a theological contrast between the animals, uh, given the very deep tradition of their presence at the scene as uh, stable cast members, as it were. They're there because the manger is theirs. Its repurposing as a crib had for centuries been understood as much more than a clever parenting hack. A place for the food of animals now holds sustenance for mankind. The word of God becomes spiritual food and Christ's body will become the substance of the Eucharist. Like many other artists of the period, Kerkin seems to have been specifically interested in the sacramental uh, resonance of the scene. Consider, for example, how Christ lies almost as much upon as within the manger. No part of his body is eclipsed by the frontal edge. Its rectilinear shape and its central position evoke the altar, which is a parallel that would have been instinctively apparent to many observers and surely to the person who commissioned Kirtan Tots and Jans to make the painting. They might well have recognized another dimension too, that stony rectangular box of the manger could also evoke a sarcophagus, which, like the altar, would portend the, uh, the child's mortality. 
countless Renaissance artists infused his infancy with his sacrifice, and they did it in countless ways. Briefly, to give you an idea of this, here, for example, on your left, with the Christ child visited by angels bearing the cross and other instruments of the passion in an earlier German painting, this one about 1400, or on the right, uh, in a later uh, Italian painting, the 1520s, that shows him supported by Mary to his side in a small coffin below. Such expansions of meaning beyond the narrative moment of Christ's birth were in keeping with the aims of such a painting. The reflective concentration of the owner found a powerful model in the scene itself with all eyes on the child. The parents, the angels, uh, and the animals draw, uh, draw close and peer inward from three sides. And the fourth is left open for us to join them at the manger. That invitation to approach would actually have felt familiar. Sermons and popular devotional texts from the late Middle Ages regularly address the faithful uh, directly, urging them to occupy the experiences of Christ's life. For example, in the widely influential Meditations on the Life of Christ, this is a text probably first written in the early 14th century and widely diffused thereafter, readers were encouraged to, and I quote, kiss the beautiful little feet of the infant Jesus who lies in the manger and ask his mother to let you hold him. Pick him up and hold him in your arms. Gaze on his face with devotion and reverently kiss him and delight in him." End quote. This kind of literature paralleled the teachings of the Devotio Moderna, a spiritual reform movement that evolved in the Netherlands and spread very far. They emphasized meditative prayer that brings individuals closer to the Lord, including imaginative projection of oneself into the moments of his life. In the Nativity at Night, that life is made all the more palpable, not only by the child's proximity and his radiance, but also by his vulnerability, naked and uncovered on a December night. Kirkin, Totes, and Jans would have known that this was a departure from the gospel account. In fact, Luke says twice that Jesus was wrapped in swaddling cloth. Like other artists who depicted him exposed, Kirkin was presenting the humility of the Lord made flesh. On this profoundly physical level, the ox and ass seem as important for their warming breath and the skin of the child as they are for any symbolic roles they may play. Of course, all of this is amplified and elevated by light. The painting came to be known as the Nativity at Night for obvious reasons. Although Luke says the shepherds were watching their flocks by night, artists had preferred daytime for the scene. Nocturnes remained rare in European art, uh, in European painting, I should say, before the 17th century. The evocative power of night is clear. But its chief appeal for the painter and his patron would have been the ability of darkness to activate light. Only against the gloom could the tiny body of the child be fully revealed as the light of the world. He alone illuminates the other figures. Where the light in daytime scenes uh, can be ubiquitous and inert or can angle, uh, angle downward from an unseen source, here light is both centrifugal and magnetic. Before the panel was damaged and trimmed and repaired, Joseph might well have held a candle, as he does in some other early Netherlandish nativities, and as he does, in fact, in most of the variants of the lost painting from which this one took a cue. A candle's paltry flame at the margin of the scene would show the magnitude of the brilliance in the manger. These animations of lights on a dark stage continue in the Annunciation to the Shepherds. There are two more light sources there. The greater is the angel uh, with whom, as Luke says, the glory of the Lord shone round about them as he delivered the good tidings. The second light is their campfire, bright but minute. That flame would have echoed the one on Joseph's candle, um, if in fact, uh, there were a candle there, there was a candle there, each of them being, in other words, an earthly light uh, profoundly outshone 
by a heavenly one. The moment on the hillside is particularly moving. Even though an observer would have known right away what's happening there, it is irresistible to lean in for a closer look, passing through the shed, as it were, uh, to share a moment of revelation with the shepherds. Their faces are almost completely invisible to us, but it doesn't matter. One has dropped to his knees, another shields his eyes, and our shared view of the glowing visitors shows us why they were sore afraid, as Luke puts it. The announcing angel appears directly above the Christ child, creating an axis of illumination, both, simul uh, both uh, inward between the moments uh, of the story and upward between heaven and earth, between earth and heaven. Uh, Herkin, who was an unusually original designer of meaningful compositions, thought in other ways too uh, about how all of this could come together. The arc of Mary's body continues in the slope of the hillside, and her inward lean echoes the tilt of the angel. In fact, they respond to each other in several ways. As he casts heavenly light downward onto the shepherds, Mary and the other angels receive it upward from Christ. The angel opens his arms to speak as Mary joins her hands to pray. The shepherds bundle against the cold as the robes of the angel dissolve in gauzy light in the sky. Below, in turn, the naked newborn meets the gaze of a mother warmed by the crisp folds of her head. These gentle alternations between far and near, announcing and praying, shining and illuminated, wrapped and exposed, concentrate our sense of encounter within both of these moments and also between them. That wordless dialogue was one of the layered ways in which the painter crafted not so much a scene as an experience. The darkest, blankest passage is the one that's closest to us at the threshold of the picture along the surface between Mary and the nearest angel. Whether one saw it only as a manger or also as altar and perhaps sarcophagus, the vacant side is an invitation to approach and marvel among the other glowing faces at nature. Thank you. Hitgen's painting is essentially part of St. Luke's Christmas narrative dressed up in St. John's imagery, perhaps not surprisingly for an artist who is a member of the commandery of the Order of St. John. Broadly speaking, this is a picture of the Lucan account, but in a Johannine style. The light of the naked word made flesh shines in the darkness, attended by Mary and the elderly Joseph, with shepherds soon to be on their way. As Al's mentioned, in this picture, Christ is one of three sources of light, alongside the angel and the shepherd's fire, but his light outshines them all. The light of both fire and angel in comparison with the celestial brightness of Christ reminds me of the irony of the scene of Jesus' arrest in John's Gospel. Judas and the police come armed with lanterns and torches to arrest the one who has declared himself to be the light of the world earlier on. This light is uncreated and unrivaled in its brilliance the light of incarnation, transfiguration and resurrection, reminding us that such a luminescence finds its origin nowhere in this world. Hietgen's scene, his surrounding scene, is one of darkness. Contemplating this picture, though, somehow draws the viewer into the darkness. It's a night one longs to be part of. There is a luminosity about this darkness, which is that of a scene change in theatrical terms as a new set swings in from the wings, or to be more precise, as this remarkable newness emerges from within the darkness in the foreground of the painting. This is a darkness which acts as the backdrop to revelation, rather than an attempt to occlude or threaten it. St Luke's Gospel doesn't tell us explicitly that the moment of Jesus' birth was actually at night. The shepherd's vision was nocturnal, but Luke isn't explicit about Jesus' birth itself. In any case, although we call this image a nativity, this isn't a depiction of the moment of birth. Rather, it's a still of adoration, 
during that night, whilst the shepherds experienced their vision on the hill in the background, Mary, a crowd of young angels and the two animals contemplate the divine infant. Even the most extravagant angelic gesture paused at this moment of wonder. There are various traditions at play in this scene beyond those in the Gospels. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, Isaiah proclaims. For those who dwelt in a land of deep shadows, on them a light has shined. This binary sense of darkness and light, which led to a kind of dualism, light and darkness, spirit and flesh, is certainly present in scripture. But there is also a rich tradition of luminous darkness when the Lord's presence is near. For example, in the Psalms, the darkness is no darkness with thee and the night is as clear as the day. The darkness and night to thee are both alike. That's from Psalm 139. Psalm 92 speaks of clouds and thick darkness being round about the Lord. From his highly individual account of the Exodus narrative, the writer of the Book of Wisdom speaks in a language which the early church seized and made its own, not least in the liturgy. When night in its swift course was now half gone, your all-powerful word leapt down from heaven from the royal throne into the midst of the land that was doomed. This is pretty standard imagery for, for the New Testament too. The night is far spent and the day is at hand, writes Paul to the Romans, offering an early take on the whole business of salvation history. But how is it working in this picture? Has the darkness failed to capture or conquer the light, a theme which runs through various pagan mythologies? Or is it that the darkness hasn't comprehended it? Well, the darkness of this night has another role too, as a veil from which the Lord emerges. In the world of the temple, the prime worshipping context of the earliest Christians, the Lord's anointed would have emerged from the Holy of Holies through the temple veil. There's a parting of shades here too, also symbolised in the picture by the angels tearing through the heavens as they announce good news to the shepherds. The heavens open as the glory of the Lord shines upon the earth. Somehow, what is happening in the Incarnation is so fundamentally extraordinary, it can't quite be processed in regular terms. This is the deep but dazzling darkness of which Henry Vaughan writes in his poem Night, inspired by Nicodemus's nocturnal visit to Jesus, also in John's Gospel, who, we're told, did at midnight speak with the sun. The presence of the ox and ass is not a surprise to those of us used to looking at nativity pictures. But as Al mentioned, they're not specifically referred to in, in any of the gospel accounts. But early Christian art probably preserves a very early tradition, not written down until the apocryphal gospel of Pseudo-Matthew in the mid eighth century. The prophecy in Isaiah that the ox and ass know their master's crib and a certain amount of striking wordplay in Hebrew relating to the princes and priests of Jerusalem was interpreted by the second century Justin Martyr as an explanation of why so many Jews had failed to recognise Jesus. The animals understand what's going on, whereas the religious and social establishment just don't get it. A little while later, the theologian Origen described these two animals as representing Jew and Gentile, the whole world coming to worship the Christ child. This image, if very early, might pick up on an even more venerable tradition, which delighted in imagining the Lord seated between two cherubim. The prophet Habakkuk declared that the Lord would be known between two creatures. The mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant itself was flanked by two angels, a tradition further developed by St. John in his account of the angels at the empty tomb. It was prophesied that the firstborn robed in wisdom and power would be seated between two creatures. And the visionary of the book of Revelation, of course, builds up that pictorial tradition even more. It's about situating the divine, the Shekinah, or the place where the Lord settles, power and glory attended and flanked by creatures. In our scene, all the more remarkable for its strange rural domesticity. By the time Hirtgen gets to it, this is a very established artistic convention. 
bolstered by the popularity of mystical writings such as the highly influential Golden Legend. But it's also perhaps an echo, an echo of an ancient, almost forgotten tradition, which has very strange layers of meaning. A responsory for matins on Christmas Day, possibly dating back to the sixth century, and famously set to music by composers from the 16th century onwards, proclaims, O great mystery and wonderful sacrament, that animals should see their Lord born lying in a manger. We've thought quite a lot about darkness and light in this seminar. Such imagery is, of course, used in different ways throughout the Bible. In the New Testament, it's quite often a fairly straightforward metaphor of the move from ignorance to understanding, from unbelief in Christ to faith in his gospel. But if we continue to develop this sense that our painting today is effectively Luke's story in John's clothes, that this is a Johannine picture, we can get beyond the limiting sense that faith is principally an act of intellectual assent to a list of other principles and into the richer challenge of how to participate in the drama of salvation through our imagination and the engagement of the heart. At the beginning of his gospel, St Luke declares his intention to set down an orderly account of what has been handed on to him from eyewitnesses. However we date Luke's text, the evangelist believes he is setting out history. He's reporting what happened. St John, however, starts from a very different place. In the beginning was the word, echoes the first verses of Genesis. For John, creation to new creation is expounded in less than one chapter. Luke is history with cosmic elements. John is cosmology gathering up history and flesh. The Christian tradition necessarily engages with both. The Devotio Moderna, the renewal movement of which Al spoke, emphasised the importance of the inner life and promoted a simple meditative spirituality which encouraged believers to imagine themselves as participants in episodes of Christ's life. Alongside those 14th century meditations on the life of Christ, other works such as Thomas Akempis's Imitation of Christ and St Bridget of Sweden's Revelations became classics of this Devotio Moderna movement. Indeed, we know that St Bridget's Revelations were sent to King Edward III here in England, buried in Westminster Abbey just a few yards away. Their popularity swept across Europe, often translated into Western European languages, as well as being read in Latin. Chapter eight of Bridget's Revelations could almost be a commissioning instruction for this painting. In 1372, she made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, including a visit to Bethlehem, where she had a vision of the Christ child, whom she records, and I quote, lying on the ground, radiant and shining. End of quote. She sees the two animals tied to the manger. The old man, Joseph, withdraws from the scene. Mary, and again I quote St Bridget, brought forth her son, from whom such ineffable light and splendour radiated that the sun could not be compared to it. End of quote. She also comments that the light of Joseph's candle paled into insignificance beside this celestial light emerging from the child. Bridget describes herself as a spouse of Christ, a daughter-in-law to Mary, who in turn bows her head with her hands together, as in this scene. St Bridget, her readers, and all those artists she inspired have become intimates of this nativity moment. In Hirtgen's picture, Mary contemplates her son and saviour with simplicity and seriousness. The whole scene is transfixed on the child, radiant and shining, allowing us a place at the manger altar. There's an exceptionally strange moment in Bridget's revelations in Jerusalem, when she likens herself, and I quote again, to an eagle who soars through the air, 
unquote. Isn't it a little bit tempting just to suppose for a moment that Bridget believes herself to have a kind of Johannine sight, and that this tradition of gospel fusion permeated the world around her writings? The eagle is, after all, the popular image used for the evangelist St John. Now, this is a theory which certainly wouldn't stand up to academic scrutiny on its own. But Bridget's writings, the artistic, spiritual and devotional traditions around them, and this picture, encourage us to hold the historical physicality of the Christmas story together with its cosmic implications. The incredible wave of mystical theology which swept across Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries had its own flowering in England. A man called Walter Hilton was an Augustinian canon based at Thurgarton Priory in Nottinghamshire towards the close of the 14th century. Hilton wrote in English and was shaped by the turbulence of the late Middle Ages. Weak governance, revolt, and the horrors of a pandemic, the Black Death, were but three features of an exceptionally anxious age. Hilton's writing is brimming with insight about the night and Christ's light. To grow in contemplation, he says, we must pass through the false light of this world into a fruitful darkness. Hilton writes, This night is nothing but a separation and withdrawal of the soul from earthly things by great desire and yearning to love, see and feel Jesus and the things of the Spirit. This is a good night and a luminous darkness, for it is a shutting out of the false love of this world, and it is a drawing near to the true day. Walter Hilton, of course, could not have known Hirtgen's picture or that of Hugo van der Herst before him. But it doubtless would have pleased Hilton to know that through engaging with this picture, we too can enter that luminous darkness, which is the background for the uncreated light of Christ the Lord, and say with St John that we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armour of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which thy Son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility. That in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, now and ever. Amen. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this lunchtime, and sincere thanks again to Professor Al Akers for being with us rather earlier in his day. Next week, the former director of the British Museum, Neil McGregor, and theologian Dr Jane Williams will discuss Botticelli's mystic nativity. You can register up until Thursday lunchtime next week in the usual way via the Abbey website. May God bless you and those you love this Advent. <laughs>